This is Intro to Logic. In this video, we'll be going over biconditionals. Biconditionals are what we might call if and only if sentences. So when I say P if and only if Q, I notice that I can represent if and only if with I, F, F. I'm telling you about the nature of P and Q, or the relationship between the two sentences. When we say P if and only if Q, we mean that P is the case whenever Q is the case. So it's necessary that Q be the case for P to be the case, and it's necessary that P be the case for Q to be the case. And it's also sufficient that if I have P, then I have Q. And it's sufficient for having P that I have Q. So right now that probably just sounds like a lot of gibberish. But once we get some examples on the table, it should start to be clear, and you can just start to think of your own examples for what if and only if relationships look like. Um, before we do that, keep in mind that we have two ways to represent the biconditional. We can represent it with three lines like this, P if and only if Q, or we can represent it with the greater than and less than symbols. I'll be using the latter throughout my videos. Let's look at the following example. Pretend we just met this lady. We'll call her Sally. Give her a little hair. All right, now we just learned that Sally wears high heels if and only if Sally wears jeans. So she's a very particular individual and she requires that in order for her to wear high heels, we'll draw them on her, she has to be wearing her blue jeans, or in this case, her green jeans. Give her a little color. All right, so what does this sentence really mean? Let's represent Sally wears high heels with an H and Sally wears jeans with a J. So we have the sentence H, if and only if J. Now, in effect, what this means is that if she wears, if Sally wears high heels, then she wears jeans. And it also means that if she's wearing jeans, then she's wearing high heels. So what this tells us is that for Sally to wear high heels, it's necessary that she wears jeans. And for her to wear jeans, it's necessary that she wears high heels. She absolutely hates wearing jeans without high heels, and she hates wearing high heels with anything but jeans. And we can also say that it's sufficient for Sally to wear high heels that she wear jeans. And it's sufficient for her to wear jeans that she wears high heels. Wearing high heels will entail that she wears jeans, and wearing jeans will entail that she wears high heels. Because she just can't wear high heels without her jeans, and she can't wear her jeans without high heels. Okay. We said a lot, and that's a mouthful. Now, what have we learned about biconditionals? We've learned that the biconditional is technically equivalent to two conditionals. So this biconditional, H if and only if J, can be represented into one big, or as one big, conjunction. We have if H then J, and if J then H. So that's, in effect, what a biconditional is. It's just one big conjunction with two conditionals, each being a conjunct of that conjunction. All right. Now, now that we have this example in hand and we've learned a little bit more about what a biconditional is, let's look at the two rules for biconditionals. There'll be biconditional introduction and biconditional elimination. Okay, so our first rule is called biconditional introduction. According to this rule, if we have two conditionals as our assumptions or other premises in a proof, and the two conditionals have the same letters such as P and Q and Q and P, but in reverse order. So notice that in line one we have the conditional if P then Q, so P is the antecedent and Q is the consequent. 
And in line two, we have another conditional with P and Q, but in this case, Q is the antecedent and P is the consequent. So we have two conditionals with the same sentence letters, which in this case are P and Q, but they're in reverse order. One's in the, the P is in the antecedent place in line one, but in the consequent place in line two, and same with Q. It's in the consequent, consequent place in line one, and in the antecedent place in line two. So since we have kind of these reverse conditionals, according to the biconditional introduction, we can take these two lines in our proof and combine them to form a biconditional. And you just represent biconditional introduction with the biconditional sign and an I. And that's that. Similarly, biconditional elimination, which is also a mouthful, allows us to take a biconditional and remove the conditionals. So according to biconditional elimination, I can use line one to derive either the conditional if P then Q or the conditional if Q then P. So from just this one line in our proof, we can derive two new conditionals, um, if P then Q or and if Q then P, and that's biconditional elimination. Okay, so here's a good example for practicing biconditional introduction and biconditional elimination. Now, of course, the first thing we're gonna do is draw our scope line and write our assumptions. So we have if R then S, if not R, then not P. P, if and only if S. And our conclusion at the bottom, R, if and only if S. Okay, so whenever we have a conclusion as, uh, or a biconditional as our conclusion, we need to keep in mind that this biconditional is equivalent to the conjunction of two conditionals, which in this case is if R, then S, and if S, then R. And we already happen to have if R then S as line one, or on line one. So that means all we have left to do is derive if S then R. And since that happens to be a conditional, we know that we can try doing a conditional proof to derive if S then R. So on line four, let's begin our conditional proof. We can write if S then R at the end of that conditional proof and R will be the consequent we're trying to derive, and S is the antecedent we will be assuming. Okay, so now that we've set up our conditional proof, let's see what we can do with S. And it looks like we can use biconditional elimination on line three to derive if S then P. And that will be useful because now we can do modus ponens and derive P from lines four and five. And now that we have P, we can look up here and see if there's anything we can do with P. Uh, it looks like the best option is trying to do modus tollens with line two. So that means we'll have to double negate P and with lines, let's see, lines two and, or no, line six, DN, now that we have a double negated P, we can input the negation of not P and derive the negation of not R, which is not not R. So we write two seven modus tollens. And now that we have not not R, we can just drop those double negations, or those two negations, and derive R from line eight. And once we've derived R, and that's the consequent of the conditional we're trying to prove, we can close out our conditional proof. So we'd write lines four through nine, CP. And then of course you'd do one more step. Now that we have the two conditionals that we need, um, one being on line 10 and one being on line one, we can just write one, 10, by conditional introduction. And of course you wouldn't have all this writing in the way, but we can just overlook that. And that's that. And this will conclude the video on biconditionals. Hopefully you've learned more about biconditional introduction and biconditional elimination, 
and just the nature of biconditionals. We look forward to seeing you next time.